I thought things were going actually really well uh, when she started apologizing for me for being tired. And, and then she got into the other part, and now expectations have built, and I'm getting nervous. And so, wow. <laughs> but um, thank you guys all very much. It, it's, it's a real pleasure and an honor to have the opportunity to present it, Ted. Uh, the title of my presentation today is More Than a Blood Sport. And before I go any further, I need to make a, a real quick expectation setting. Uh, yeah. um, I'm not going to say anything original today. I'm not going to bring up anything that hasn't already been done or said. There's no original research, no great books. As I was reading through all the TED presentations, I thought, my contemporaries are fantastic and I'm never going to make it. Nonetheless, um, so I need to thank and apologize to all the people that I stole from blindly uh, to make this presentation possible. You see, uh, one of my great pleasures in life is martial arts. Uh, I've studied martial arts. My dad got me into martial arts when I was five, so for 32 years, I've studied boxing and Muay Thai and uh, Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. And if you, you name it, I went to the school and studied it for a while. And I've always been an exceptionally happy person. And, and there were many, many, there were innumerable benefits from mixed martial arts and, and studying them that, that came to me. But, you know, one that came to me that was the least obvious was happiness. See, when you think about studying martial arts, or most people think about studying martial arts, what, what comes to them is, is, yeah, you know, you get to be tough and you get to learn how to defend yourself and, and you, get to, you get to pick up, uh, you, know, you get to go in and save the girl and save the day. You know, because when you watch martial arts movies, what happens? It's the same story every year, every different, in different cultural contexts or historical contexts. It's the same story, right? The guy comes in and he's like, whoa, and there's a big fight. And then he saves some damsel in distress and then he saves the village, right? What they don't tell you is, is that martial arts is about happiness and, and that through the practical application of this and the study of martial arts, it brings a tremendous amount of joy to your life. And if you think about what really matters in life, there's very few things that matter more than joy. So the, this presentation is about joy and happiness and how mixed martial arts is, and the study of mixed martial arts uh, really is a great avenue for that. So I wanted to start by calibrating the audience. I could have drawn this map, if this presentation had taken place in Europe, I could have drawn this map and it would have been Europe and I could have shown you different martial arts that were in each of the different European cities or each of the different European countries, if you will. The truth is, is that in every culture pretty much in the world, there's some native form of martial arts. And the reason I bring that up is, is because martial arts is inside us. It's inside of all of our cultures. It doesn't matter if you're English or German or Swiss or if you're Thai or Chinese or Japanese. Kung Fu, Muay Thai, all the way down the continent. You can look everywhere from India to, to uh, Indonesia. It's all there. And so martial arts is, is it's inside of all of us. And it's something that we grew up with. Now, part of the reason we grew up with it was practical necessity. But more than that, through the study of martial arts, there were a lot of other benefits that are new to that society through the study. And as we begin to step back from martial arts, we've stepped back from a lot of those benefits. So... Globalization and the advent of mixed martial arts. Before Thomas Friedman had come out and told us that the world was flat, before the first internet uh, search engine had ever come out, uh, you know, in fact, it's amazing how far that is ago, in the early 1990s, the world of martial arts was ripe for innovation. And, and what I mean by that is, is that martial arts, because we had stopped having a lot of hand-to-hand -hand combat on a daily basis, Martial arts continued to be practiced, but it became uniquely siloed. So you didn't just have karate, you had unique types of karate. You didn't just have Muay Thai, you had, or not Muay Thai, but Kung Fu, you had unique styles of Kung Fu. And what began to happen is, is that these arts no longer shared information with each other. And they became a lot more about form than they did about function, because the function wasn't getting tested in any real arena. So globalization, 1990s, ripe for innovation, overly siloed. The UFC came around in 1993 in uh, Denver, Colorado, and it changed all of this. The UFC stands for the Ultimate Fighting Championships. A Brazilian family that had been undefeated for over 50 years got together, and they said, we're going to put a contest together, and we're going to see if dragon style, is, dragon style kung fu is better than flying eagle karate. It didn't matter, or sumo, or western boxing. And what they did was is they created an octagon with a cage around it, put it up in pay-per-view, and they said, let's see who's the best. And it was like a, like a Wimbledon tennis draw, if you will. They'd have, you know, the first match, sumo versus Western boxing. Any size, very few rules, 
karate versus kung fu. Well, you can imagine the martial arts world went crazy because everybody had a, a dog in the hunt. They're like, oh, you can use your you know, secret dragon punch. You, you, know, you, you can use that now. It's legal. And there were, these huge, there were these huge forms that they had to sign that said, if I die from your secret move, it's okay. I won't, right? <laughs> it was really, it's really what happened. So, so UFC 1993, what came from it was a mass wave of innovation. And the way that, way that innovation took place was basically it became clear that there was no secret move, there was no secret art, and that each one of these arts had a different facet that was really applicable in a, in a, in a, in a situation. So guys began to start stu studying you know, Western boxing hands, Muay Thai feet and elbows, Brazilian jiu-jitsu on the ground, American wrestling, and uh, then, they would even, they, then they would even roll in Greco-Roman wrestling. So really, it was, it was a, a, one of the earliest examples that I can see of major globalization taking place and innovation. So UFC didn't start MMA. Uh, Bruce Lee did, actually. He was one of the first guys, but they did, but MMA did popularize it. Now, what's really interesting about Bruce Lee, and it's really pertinent to Hong Kong, had he been around an extra 10 or 15 years, I mean, he died very prematurely, he was in the process of transforming martial arts. Because one of the things that made him so unique and so innovative was that he genuinely was ahead of the curve. Um, and he was, he was beginning to mix arts before anybody else, and he was beginning to really talk about it. And the amount of heat he took for that was, was extraordinary. He was really a courageous man, much more than a movie star. So, like all innovation, uh, there is controversy. I gotta pick it up here. Uh, it was very controversial. John McCain, when it first came up, he said, hey, when the UFC first came out, he said, there's no room for this in modern society. It's human cockfighting. And he tried to shut it down, but as we all know, mixed martial arts is now one of the fastest growing sports in the world. So thankfully, he wasn't successful. So I look at myself and I think about my life, and I, I love MMA, but I don't share a lot in common with these guys. <laughs> I mean, no one's ever, I mean, I don't lift weights, this is painfully obvious. I'm not a big fan of tattoos because I'm a bit of a commitment phobe, and I can't imagine having anything that wouldn't wash off. And no one's ever thought of me as being tough. So eh, there must be something wrong with me. Okay, but wait, that's not possible. Because what we've found is, is that the average person doesn't believe they're average. And that our ability to externalize situations, most people appear to believe that we are more athletic, intelligent, organized, ethical, logical, interesting, open-minded, and healthy, not to mention more attractive than the average person. So clearly, there's nothing wrong with me, there's something wrong with everybody else. So, what's the deal? Why do I love MMA so much? Because it makes me happy. But then my inner five-year-old comes out and says, but why does it make me happy? So then, finally, we get to some data that's worthy of TED. And what we see here is that psychologists, sociologists, and economists have gotten together, and they've been doing a lot of really interesting research in this field. And what they find is, is that the average income, as it rises above about $10,000 uh, in 1995 levels, real, it's about $11 an hour today, give or take US dollars a little bit. Anything above that does almost nothing to increase a person's happiness. Now, why is that significant? Well, because most people in this room, most professionals make exponentially more than $11 an hour. And yet, if you look at the data, that's what data looks like when you don't want it to be correlated. It means that above $11 an hour, you don't get happier because you make more money. And that's very significant because most of us will spend most of our lives trying to make money for the sake of making money. So, three important drivers of happiness, and then I'll explain how they're relevant to martial arts. First, family, friends, and community. It's, it's, it's your group, it's your, and the Hawaiians would call it your hui. It's the people you associate with and the relationship that you have with them. It's authentic bonds. That brings a lot of happiness. The next is this idea of, they use a more technical term for it, but we've heard this forever. It's called being here now. It's focusing on the present, not worrying about the future or regretting the past, but it's actually being in the moment, uh, doing whatever you're doing. Even if what you're doing isn't pleasurable, being in that moment, you're better off uh, from a happiness point of view. Uh, the, the technical term they're using is mind-wandering, and I, I've sourced the people here. It's a really interesting stuff to research. The next one is this idea of flow, and we'll go into this more. Um, I want to go into it more in the context of martial arts, but it's kind of the idea that when you see Michael Jordan and... He, he's, he's, he's making that last minute shot and he's just, and after he makes it and you kind of listen to him talk and he said, yeah, it was like the, the hoop just got larger. 
And it's, it's this experience that artists and uh, uh, musicians and at really people, people that are excellent in athletics, it's this experience that it, this, um, how do I describe this? Um, well, basically what it is, is, is when one becomes completely lost in a task and the ecstasy that comes from that, and that task requires a high degree of skill and it's challenging. Tiger Woods making a 100-foot putt to win the U.S. Open. Michael Jordan making an you know a, a incredibly long three pointer in it's it's the uh, it, it's the the mental state they are when they make that so family friends and community so this is this is just some shots that I pulled right off of our Facebook page literally fifteen minutes fifteen minutes ago so you look you can see somebody teaching you can see more teaching you can see being awarded you can see two people actually training together. You can see submission. Why are these important? Well, they're important because communities are more than just, hey, he's my friend. And, and what a community has to have, the, the core elements of it, trust, and is, is a, key, a key aspect of that. When I train with somebody, whether they're better than me or I'm better than them, it doesn't matter. What matters is, is that I don't hurt them if I'm in a superior position and that they don't allow themselves to get hurt. And the way that they don't allow themselves to get hurt is they submit, they tap, they say uncle in essence. So all of your training partners, there's a real reciprocity of trust that's required. I won't hurt you, you won't allow me to, and you won't allow me to hurt you because you'll submit first, right? So, so there's an implicit in this with all of your training partners, trust, trust happens. The second is guidance. In a community, you have to have leaders. And having really solid martial arts instructors around that can te teach you not only the technical guidance, but can actually teach you also some of the, the values and the ethos of the arts provides a really nice amount of guidance around it. The next is camaraderie. In, in any good academy, you train very hard. There's a lot of sweat and a lot of perspiration. And there's times when things are going amazingly well and you're getting better, and there's times when you're not and you're frustrated. But sharing that bond builds a real camaraderie, and there's crucible experiences that come into there that build really authentic bonds. The next is aligned interests. Whether I'm better than the person or the person's better than me training, I'm learning and growing. I learn by teaching. I learn by being taught. So that, that symbiotic relationship, all of these things create a really strong sense of family, friends, and community. And I would contend there's very, place, very few places in society, particularly a modern society like Hong Kong or any modern city, where you actually have the opportunity to build this. Churches are another. But there aren't many. And in fact, they're actually in decline in society, and you know, hence what we're seeing in terms of happiness. So the next is the idea of focus. So I really like this picture because this guy is a very successful hedge fund trader here in Hong Kong. And uh, he's in the middle of a boxing training, and you, you look at him. Yeah, I'll, I'll pick it up. And uh, he's not thinking about his last trade. He's not thinking about his tax returns. He's not thinking about anything other than don't get hit, don't get hit, don't get hit, hit. Don't get hit, don't get hit, don't get hit, hit. He's totally focused. And if you think about your lives, how few times you have the opportunity to get totally focused on something. So, uh, or, or this picture of Yoda, or this is one of our instructors, and I love it, how he's hanging by his feet and he makes it look easy. That's really hard. <laughs> so they're very focused. So here are a couple of quotes, and I, I really, I, I read this quote to myself every day. I think it's so profound. Uh, I'm gonna read it fast. The way of the samurai is found in death. Meditating on inevitable death should be performed daily. Every day when one's body and mind are at peace, one should meditate upon being ripped apart by arrows, rifles, spears, swords, being carried away by surging waves, being thrown in the midst of great fires, being struck by lightning, being shaken to death by a great earthquake, falling from thousand-foot cliffs, dying of disease, or committing seppuku with the death of one's master. And every day, without fail, one should consider himself as dead. This is the substance of the way of the samurai. Now, if you think about that, if you're already dead, you're not worried about tomorrow. What you did in the past is irrelevant. You are here, you are now. And the reason they had to have this is because if you go into a sword fight, the last thing you can afford to do is to be tight. Because you really, there's no such thing as bad swordsmen, right? You know, bad samurai don't live very long, <laughs> right? So you can't be tense. You have to be in the flow. You have to maintain your focus. And if you read that to yourself every day, it's amazing what an impact that's had in my life. Masashi Metamoto had over 650 sword fights and never lost one. He's one of the only samurais that died of old age. To know 10,000 things, know one well. 
And the, the essence of that, by focusing and understanding how to do one thing really well, and the focus required to master one thing, you can master anything else. But first, learn how to master one thing. So, Bruce Lee, life is about adding. It's not, or life is not about adding, it's about taking away. Now we'll talk about flow and the psychology of optimal experience. So we've already talked about martial arts, and you can imagine that you can imagine that in mixed martial arts, there's, it, it's, like th- it's often described as three-dimensional chess, right? Because there's, you, have a, you, have, you, you have your body that you're moving to be thinking about what you're doing, thinking about what the other person's doing. There's, an el- there's a, a many elements of timing associated with it. So it clearly falls into this idea, better than almost anything I know, to be really good is incredibly challenging. And the skill level associated with it is as high as it comes. So in the practice, in the pursuit of just trying to get there, we naturally fall into flow. And that is one of what psychologists say, the, the peak states of happiness a human being can have. So, let's talk about Salo Ribeiro a four-time world champion in Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. This quote sums it up perfectly. If you think you're late, if you're late, you use strength. Because you have to just like, oh, push your way out of it. If you use strength, you tire. And if you tire, you die. That's the essence of flow. Right? It's all about timing. It's all about being tight. Bruce Lee, this one's too long given the amount of time I have, but basically it says, be like water. Empty your mind, be formless, shapeless, like water. If you put water into a cup, it becomes the cup. You put water into a bottle, it becomes the bottle. You put it in a teapot, it becomes the teapot. Now, water can flow or it can crash. Be water, my friend. So these psychologists, these sociologists, these economists, what they're finding we already had in our tradition. We've lost it. It was already there. Through the study of martial arts, the accidental things that came to us and benefited us as a society were hugely important to our happiness, potentially more important than material wealth. Now, MMA, it equals happiness, fitness, and personal security, plus self-confidence. But there's more. A final word from a legend. This is the founder or one of the founders of Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. Jiu-Jitsu gives you confidence and helps you feel good about yourself. And when you get that feeling, you stay with the art. Not only that, but whenever you have confidence in yourself, you become more tolerant, respectful of others. It may seem ironic that a combat sport could teach you to become a more humane person, but I really believe that. To love one another, to be caring towards your fellow man, that is what jiu-jitsu has taught me. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you.